As everybody doing, we're back for a segment or session or installment eight. number eight. <laughs> we run out of remembering what they are. I was talking about, obviously, when I was losing my sight and things were going crazy, I was trying to figure out what numbers were on houses, and you should have seen me in the subways. I was a terror. Um, one night I had. Wait, 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 wait. What does that mean? You were a terror in the subway. I think people were scared to death of me. Here, you know, here's this guy looking up. At the oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to qualify that a little. And, I've and never it, heard and that. It, and he's big. Were you jumping turnstiles and stuff? I uh, never jumped them. Uh, I did go over one one time when I thought I was going to miss it and almost knocked an old lady down. <laughs> so I quit running through there, you know. I quit doing my OJ Simpson in the airport. <laughs> and I'm definitely not going to drive a car down the highway either <laughs> at five miles an hour. Uh, I it would be safer, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some things that happened prior to, you know, going, losing my sight, the, the progress, or is that the right word, the, the progressiveness of my sight getting worse. I was on pretty heavy medication, and they had me on one that was never told to me that it would dry me up a lot. And so one night at singing at Malachy's on 72nd and Lexington was my place where I sang every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I had lots of stars that come in here. Amongst them were um, the Fifth Dimension people. They came in quite a bit. Uh, Havens would come in and say, you know, visit. Uh, Richie Havens. Yeah. Different people would come in to just say hi on their way, either out of town or whatever, just to say hello. Uh, and I'm going to wait to let you read it in the book, but I basically had an incredible thing happen to me. Right in the middle of a song, my voice went out. And I mean, literally went out. Like nothing. Yeah, I mean, nothing I would go, out. I would be like, if I tried, <laughs> and I mean, God, I, you know, I was thinking, <clears throat> so I sipped some water, uh, or at that time, I'd even started using them. I'm not a drinker. I, I would sip that stuff that tastes like gasoline. What does that was? Uh, Southern comfort. Yeah. Oh, God, you know. <laughs> and being a non-drinker, you know, someone said that might help cut. Turned out Janis Joplin used it all the time. Yeah, well, there you go. So it's that, a good that's thing why her voice was that. like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love uh, Janis, but. <laughs> yeah, I do too. She's a great talent. So anyway, I um, um, lost the voice, packed my guitar up, and I walked. From 72nd to 21st, straight down, uh, down the east side, and then went straight across over to, from Lexington over to um, um, 7th Avenue, because I lived in an apartment there. And what happened after that is what you'll have to wait to read in the book, but it was pretty traumatic, and uh, I'm still here, and I may not have been if it hadn't been for a phone call, so it was pretty crazy times. Um, that's probably the only time I recall where I really got scared about what was going on with, with me and losing my eyes. I, I had this horrible feeling that I was, you know, you remember I told you they had the ad on TV for mm -hmm. the lighthouse, showed this little frail guy tapping a cane down the street and they were trying to raise funds for that. Something in my mind got me thinking I looked like him. I didn't have a cane, but and of course I was almost six four and two hundred plus pounds, so I couldn't have been too frail. But that was a period of time where I really thought that was going on in my life, and it took a good friend, and you can read that, Mike, uh, um, um, Paul, uh, Paul Michael's deck. Uh, he really pulled me through that with some just plain old. Here's how it is, Turley, and it was really good to have a friend to do that, you know. So. That kind of led to, you know, all up through the that year, you know, I was still making it. And um, the, the man, new management company, uh, Schwade, Marenstein, and Thal, or Thal, rather, um, started getting things, got me signed to ICM, which is the number one at that time, booking agency. It used to be William Morris that was with before, but this one was, a, you know, a different one. And, uh, they started getting me a lot of little gigs. I was starting to get up TV stuff. Carson's show was on the right on the 
uh, a rising, I guess the right word. But you were on some other TV talk shows as well, right? Right, but I'm saying all those kind of fell one after the other. I, I've got on, after Carson was the main one, then I did Mike Douglas, uh, Merv Griffin, Dick Cavett. Um, uh, who else? There was one other one. Oh, Dick Clark. Um, just a whole bunch of TV stuff started happening. You're forgetting David Frost. And, well, I'm leading up. Yeah. And then the big one was David Frost. And there's a story in there that will shock anybody that knows anything about, you know, making it big. Um, I had an incredible deal offered to me by David Frost, and you can read about that. Um, and then, of course, that's when I got into Lou Marenstein and I started looking for songs. And um, But you, you did eventually get on the Carson show. The okay. first time you didn't get on. Oh, no, the first time. <laughs> Talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there was a bunch of us in the green room. Uh, I, I can't remember all the people, but some of them were, were like um, Woody Allen and Maury Amsterdam and some people like that were all back in the green room. And Tony Randall wouldn't stop talking it just kept talking and the car screen couldn't get him off there and it went past and cut about three of us out of being on and there was a lot of angry people in the green room but they had you back yes but that's what they said we'll have you back and it was a week later two weeks later and then they had me back on and this time i did get on and that was in 1969 I, I did have a fun thing happen in the green room that time William Holden was there, and he heard me talking about this new dog I got. I, I got a Rhodesian Ridgeback, not as a guide dog, but as a pet. On purpose, I wanted a pet so I didn't have to have a guide dog. I, I was going to fight anything to do with blindness. But anyway, uh, he came over to me and said, I heard you talking about your Rhodesian Ridgeback. And I said, oh, yeah, I just got it. He said, would you like to have dinner with me after the show, and I'll tell you the history of Ridgeback. Of course, I said, Mr. Olden, if I wouldn't have dinner with you, my mom would kill me. <laughs> I'm sure how much he liked that. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what happened. So he took me out after dinner, and I learned a whole lot about the Rhodesian Ridgeback, and he was my buddy. He was the last thing I ever saw. And the Carson Show is a really big deal. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, there's some people out there that don't remember Johnny Carson being the... the well, uh, actually, Johnny's bigger than any of the ones Letterman right. and all of them came later. He... I mean, the show was 42 years. And I think it took a lot of digging for you to find the videotape that you have. There is a videotape of that show. Um, but that was difficult for you to get a hold of. Well, you we had to pay for it. We actually bought the kinescope at the beginning, right. but uh, I lost it somewhere along the line. I had to do a lot of research to find it. And then we had it dumped on to eventually a DVD. Mm -hmm. And that's how come I have it on my, you know, on my uh, website yeah. now, www.turleyriches.com, where you can go see a lot of things. And it's all, all over career. YouTube also. And it's all over YouTube, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a fun, it was fun to do it. I had the longest ovation ever on the Carson Show for a singer. And four fifty. And there's a good reason for that. Yeah, four dollars and fifty cents will buy me a cup of coffee at the Starbucks. I don't get, I don't buy into those things too much, but other people do because it kind of adds to the hype. It was, I mean, it was magical. You know, they, the crowd loved what I did, and I enjoyed. I was treated really nice there at that show. Well, I buy into it. I'm in awe of you. Oh so well, I appreciate that. that right. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? You heard it, guys. <laughs> I don't know what to say. You got a minute left, so you don't I've got a minute much. to say, you know. So, uh, <laughs> well, hope you're enjoying this because we are. We're hoping that it's going to give you some insight of me and what I do in my life, and of course, my lovely wife now that's with me is going to be with me through all these. Hopefully, going to do a bunch of lectures, uh, music lectures. I'll probably, you know, talk and sing. And maybe even after the lecture, I'll stay around and do a, a set of music for the corporations and stuff. And looking also for private, you know, concerts, private uh, parties, mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky, and we're ready to go anywhere we have to go to get things happening. And I guess we will see you on the next whatever. Number Special. nine. Right? Yeah. Take care. Please, please, please. Yeah, I'm gonna